as you say, you know, the setup is very familiar. We, we know what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it's there to do. Um, and so whether that's a TED talk or whether that's the film industry or whether that's mm. how we expect to experience art on a wall or whatever, I think I'm often interested in doing something with that somehow. Do you feel like you somehow, um, because it was very engaging, mm. um, you still are trying to achieve a level of engagement that the initial format maybe has? Yeah, to, I mean, that is something that I'm interested in generally anyway. You know, I think early on in my career, you know, I, I've, I played a lot with um, things that, require much more of an investment from the viewer or the audience, such as um, durational performance, um, for example. Um, you know, it really requires a, a particular ask from somebody engaging with that. Um, and then I think probably a, pro a progression for me is, is, is working towards the other end of that scale that is in some ways, what entertainment does, you know, tries to lure you in or grab you. Um, and I guess I'm interested in that because um, it's, it's because, because politically what I'm interested in and what I'm interested in um, my work doing, um, it doesn't work if it's only people who are interested anyway come to it. It has to engage people who are not expecting it or not might not be particularly interested in that or you know so that so that mode of engagement using humor using you know i specifically asked them when i speak to ted people if i could do a i was interested to do a shorter talk than 17 minutes you know it's and i'm, I'm interested you know more people will watch it if it's shorter you know so i'm so I, i'm I'm interested in in those modes, you know, I guess. So it's so so that so it's per, it is purposefully engaging and entertaining, but not just as a kind of um, strategy, um, not solely a strategy. It's also what engages me, you know, yeah. stuff that I click on, or you know, I will click on shorter videos, or you know, or mm. I do like certain kinds of humor and entertainment and things like that so it's so it's not just as a an outsider it's partly of course it is about strategy and um thinking about the audience and how and who you want to engage with but it's also um investing it you know using those modes that i'm interested in do you also think um in contemporary art that there is almost a sense of um carelessness towards the audience generally like whether the audience would respond to something? You mean in terms of how people, how we... Well, in terms of how the work is presented. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you, you could see it in two ways. I mean, I think it really depends work to work, artist to artist, show to show, mm. in my opinion, because I think on one hand, um, one of the absolute beauties of contemporary visual art is that you can be in a slower space you can be in a less linear form of engagement uh, and you can do all of these things that you can't do in regular broadcast or um, advertising or entertainment and all of those things. And I think that's it's one of its greatest strengths. However, with that, you know, also comes, can come complacency, can come laziness, can come um, navel gazing, you know, and and so yeah, in in some cases it can be a that there be a, a carelessness or or not really, you know. I've heard some people talk about they're not really too bothered about what the audience thinks, right? Um, and that's definitely the opposite of how I feel. I think. Yeah. You know, I probably wouldn't ask the question which one comes first, but how do we then position audience in relation to the work? It's. It, it's difficult to articulate that in a way. Like I, I don't, I don't ever feel restricted or bound mm. by that in a sense, you know, at the start, I'm very disciplined to follow my instinct and my gut and my obsessiveness um, into what I'm drawn to 
almost out of my control, you know, and, and I try to give myself space to indulge in that. And then, you know, not too far down the line, I, I, I definitely think about the audience, you know, in, in, in what way are they going to experience this? Um, is it in a gallery? Is it not? Is it on Insta? Is it all of those things? Is it in performance? Is it an art audience? Is it TV audience? Whatever, you know, I, I definitely think about those things and, and that doesn't, and, and that won't necessarily restrict the work. What it sometimes does is reaffirms what it's doing or sometimes if it's if it if it jars differently to that there can immediately spawn different versions of the work you know so it's not like i would necessarily stop myself doing this thing because i think oh the art audience wouldn't engage or a public audience wouldn't engage with this maybe just an art audience would but then it gives me an idea as a a seed to, as another version of the work that this audience would engage with and it's not doing it specifically for that audience, but it, it sparks a real desire in me to make that version of the work. Um, you know, so it's kind of, so I would say it definitely, I, I'm not sort of thinking at the beginning, the audience, unless, unless it's the, unless it's an invitation. So mm. for example, you know, sometimes I was commissioned once by Kanduko Dance Company, who are a, who are a company of disabled and non-disabled dancers. And they invited me to think about how they're seen by an audience, um, the perception of disability of professional dance and that. And, and so that immediately comes with an invitation to start with the audience, if you like. Um, and, and so that is a, a particular angle, which I also enjoy, I guess, a bit like you say about the Ted talk and its format and that. So, so in a way that, you could consider that of starting with the audience in terms of knowing who watches and how, but at the same time, that work that we created for that TED talk came from something I made for a theater yeah. and then, then readapted it. So, so where does the work come from then? <clears throat> and is it, um, you know, at what point do you choose the medium? I, I think it comes at different points. Um, it, it's not the same every time in terms of when you choose a medium. Like a, a lot of my work comes from the gut in a way and, and it's often quite physical. So I feel like a lot of the work comes from residents in my body. Um, you know, it comes with um, a desire for a movement or, or finding myself... Um, returning to a posture or a movement or something in my daily life or when I stop and think or, or whatever it is and so something can so things can come from that um, or it can come from a real desire for a texture um, you know um, at the minute I'm making a series mm. of paintings which are at the base of them this super high gloss um, of car paint um and and so this so you know at the at the guttural part of that it's 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 that texture um that's kind of leading the work and then so it sort of started to lend itself towards painting potentially objects um whereas the physical impetus probably would start thinking in performance in movement in video and then as it goes on, um, as I try things, I sort of look at them and, and go, yes, this is this this needs to be performance. Or sometimes I look at it and go, no, actually, this is not going to work as performance. It needs to be images or it needs to be video. And sometimes you you try a bunch of these things because you're not quite sure, and they all work, you know. Or, or sometimes they none of them work. And so yeah, I, I feel like I have to be quite open in. The, the early part of the process of trying to be as non-judgmental of the ideas as possible, you know, to, to kind of follow something through to a certain level through, through instinct and, and not worry too much at that stage and, and to give it a little time before you kind of step back and make that judgment of this isn't working or this, this feels right, you know, and then, and then audience and context and stuff will start to come in after that, I think. 
I mean, one of the things I'm doing basically as part of this series of talks is, you know, I'm an architect, so I don't, um, I don't understand the fully the language of the art world. And I, I you know, obviously I'm engaged with it uh, to a certain extent, but, you know, as I'm, as I'm doing this and I'm talking to all these different people, I'm kind of discovering all these different types of artists. And it's really fascinating to, to see what the kind of, well, similar to the question I've just asked is like, where does, you know, where does the medium come in? Where does the idea come in? And, you know, at what point does, do those things emerge in your practice? So I was talking to uh, a painter, Andrew Grassi, and, you know, he has a technique and he has a kind of meditative process that he is completely in tune with the process of like painting egg tempera, um, these beautiful little paintings. And his main artistic desire is to find what to paint. It's like, what, what does one paint? What does one process through a medium that is somehow his medium? So, but you seem to be a type of artist where the artistic practice is maybe embodied in your experience of the world or how would you, how would you put it? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. It's definitely, you know, the, the idea or the impulse always comes first. Um, well, even even saying that, not necessarily. You know, sometimes I break or end up breaking those rules. I, I think, I think the thing I've learned most about myself through these years in, in sense of that is is to trying to be open to the impulse, uh, 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 and um, and tr and trying to be honest with myself as possible about where something comes from, and what my desire is or my itch or you know obsessiveness at that point without having ever let myself get into I do this I make this and so I need to make another one of these um, you know at the very early stages of my career I remember first being in the press um, and people referring me to as referring to me as a photographer and I was like I'm not a photographer why are they call me a photographer but then at that point I'd only ever shown photographs so of course, you know, <laughs> why wouldn't you call me a photographer? And, and, I, and I remember having a real reaction against that. Um, and, and so then I started to also make video works. Um, and then that started to expand into performance and other things. And, and I think it's that I don't feel necessarily that, um, you know, I'm obsessed with one medium enough for it to be my lifelong um, thing, if you like. I mean, I probably do film more than other things and performance, but still I need to do where the ideas go, if you like. And it's partly, to, I think it's to do with, it's partly to do with what, how to exist in the world, you know, you know, so maybe it's a socio-political thing, you know, it's that I grew up in a way where I was very restricted, where, you know, British Asians are marginalized um and boxed and all of those things and so in my practice i feel like i'm interested in expansion um in occupying um and you know and, and all of these things that i receive things in you know i receive things in moving image in performance in people in objects in things and so i feel like i want to communicate in all of these things you know it feels like a, a natural response if you like you know, it's, um, I grew up, you know, I, I'm sure you speak a number of languages yourself. You know, I grew up bilingual. So it's kind of, you, you sort of learn very early on that there isn't just one way to say something, to understand something, to be something. And, and this really is at the core of my practice. Um, and so it's trying to make sure that I stay limber um, and, and, and open and free. And, and it partly... Um, it helps my interrogation of my own work and, and my questioning. So, you know, I'm always asking myself, you know, just why is this a performance? Could it not just be a video? Um, could it just be a, um, a series of photographs or a series of drawings? I always ask myself, no matter what medium I'm working in. And so that helps me interrogate and refine 
why something should exist in a particular medium. You know, if there's film, for example, you can do things that you can't do in other media, like time lapse or slowing something down loads or, you know, with, with, a, with a photograph, obviously you, you stop time or with painting in a particular style, you can take liberties with reality or, you know, all of these things. And so I think in terms of where it comes from, it's definitely increasingly um, politically motivated. So I'm interested in um, visibility, not just for myself, for any minority culture within the mainstream. So, and, and this doesn't necessarily, is not just about representation, but it's about transformation. So, you know, how you can um, transform these things, if, if you like, and not, not just have, there are other artists doing the important work of um, representation of of putting um, things out in the ether in a in a purposefully ordinary way, if you like, because that's what needs to happen. I think I occupy maybe a, a slightly different place where um, I'm interested in applying a transformation to those things in order to, you know, you could say it's more shouty or more attention grabby or but something where you can't deny it somehow. I feel like I've just if, veered off way away from your question there. <laughs> no, but I think that's exactly, I think, I think, you know, I think you, you, you let me to kind of think about, I don't know, psychoanalysis. And I'm just wondering if, if, if we make a psychoanalytic parallel, may, maybe the way to understand is to ask you, who are you in this psychoanalytic uh, situation? Are you the psychoanalyst or are you the person that's being analyzed? Um, I, I think probably I would, I would have to be both or I'll go from one to the other. You know, I, I, I work from an impulse of how I feel. So, you know, my, in the sense that my, my autobiography definitely informs my work and I'm interested in, reacting against freedoms that I've not had and continue not to have. Um, but at the same time, as I, as my agency increases, as my voice and visibility increases, I'm interested in um, additionally helping create this for other people, you know, uh, with the understanding also that if I'm creating it for myself in, um, in a real way, I'm also creating it for others, you know? Um, and so, you know, it does help exercise my, um, my tools and my practice by working outside of my own stuff as well. You know, when I'm commissioned by Kanduko to make a work that's kind of led by disability, or if I'm commissioned by choreographer Amy Bell to look at um, queerness and gender, or by another group to look at, you know, um, young people, or that sort of thing, you know, those things, my engagement with that does help me to, as I say, sharpen my tools and to exercise my empathy. Um, and to, you know, be the be the listener, but to, to hold space in order. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, um, and a lot of those works is is really about listening, holding space and, and trying to articulate for somebody else what they might not be able to articulate for themselves in that moment. And, and that's often what the, what the work becomes in those instances. Um, but then I also do that for myself somehow. And, you know, I need to somehow also do that just for my own impulse of how I feel about myself. I guess you've developed those tools by uh, being in, well, doing that to yourself in a sense. And so then you're kind of exporting those tools into other forms of um, relationships and yeah, I think so. I think so. Like when I when I did the commission for Kanduko, it was really interesting because, you know, I don't have any personal experience with disability, um, and so where I was coming at it from was what I do have experience of is being from a marginal, marginalized culture and assumptions being made about me, um, which are incorrect a, a lot of the time. And so I was coming at it from that field uh, and, and that, in, that actually 
um, provided a really great bridge uh, for me to be able to then have those conversations with the dancers and and to bring out a work which which you know I felt like I was using the same ethos uh, if you like. Mm. Um, that's if we stay on the meat on the question of the medium, mm. I'm wondering whether there is a very particular and if we if we put that in relationship to the psychoanalyst and the person being analyzed, I'm wondering whether there there are mediums that are more appropriate for self expression or some of the mediums are more appropriate for this kind of me, media, mediational aspect of your work, if that's the word. Medi I, I, I think it's less to do with medium and mm -hmm. more to do with, um, in, in all of these instances, whether it's me for myself or me um, being, you know, a director or a medium for somebody else, if you like, if you want to call it that, um, it's about people being seen on their own terms. Um, so, you know, for me, um, that's easier to do in a way. I, I'm aware of how I'm seen in the, in the press or by other arts or whatever, and, and I can respond to that. And for somebody else, it might be different. So, for example, you know, if I work with Kanduko, they're performers, they're live performers. They're not video makers, they're not painters uh, as, their, as their primary thing. Yeah. So they're, they're very engaged with... Um, the terms that they are seen with in, in this in this thing so so it makes sense for me to do something in 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 their medium if you like whereas if it's i was invited if i was to go in and i was invited by a youtuber um who you know just shoots videos from their kitchen then you know that's probably the medium i would use it's kind of like yeah it's kind of like part of that empathy exercise part of that listening exercise is about trying to key into and how can I help with you being seen as you want to be seen? Does that now relate to that quote, the Bruce Lee quote that you I'd be like water. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Yeah, it is. It's being as responsive as, as possible in a way. But but also, you know, it's not just um, it's not like, say, coaching, right? So, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a typical way that coaching works, um, there's a belief that the coachee already has all of the answers that they will ever need. And, and that, you know, that as the coach, your job is to help them, is, is to hold a space and, and create a space for them to bring that out, solve their own problems, you know, and this sort of thing. Whereas it's different for me as an artist you know, part of the exercise is that is creating those space for people to try to help people to articulate for themselves how they like to be seen what they want. But then it's a there's a different stage involved where I'm still bringing my direction, my aesthetic, my humor, all of that to the work. So, you know, in in the in the what tends to happen in those scenarios is people really see the people that the performance mm -hmm. for who they are um and yet you also get a really a real signature from me you know you do recognize that it's my work or it's my tone or it's my politics or my approach to the politics if you like so it's it's very collaborative in that sense you know so it's not you, you, i couldn't describe it as purely a selfless act of therapy or coaching or you know it is a it is an artistic act which employs um some of the tools I would say from those things to try to make it as fair or as honest as, as possible, really. You know, it doesn't work for me if it's just, I have an idea and a vision. Can you come and do this, perform this for me? You know, it's like, um, or, not, or not in those scenarios anyway, it might be if I'm making a film, but it's in those scenarios, it's, it's important to me that it's doing some work. You know, when I went with the Can Do Co Commission, They've, they kept that in their rep for years. You know, mm. the, the only the only reason they stopped it more recently is because the dancers, some of the dancers moved on. Um, and, you know, it really did something for their company that people would start talking to them in the bar after like humans rather than 
somebody in a wheelchair or you know that sort of thing and and so I, I was I was really proud that um that felt like one of the first instances of of being able to try to translate my process for myself to somebody else and so but okay so now now the process does come from your own development as an artist has there in that process of personal artistic development been a moment where you became the medium? Do you know, maybe it was through the invitation from from Kanduko. This was in right. 24, this was in 2014. Um, I wouldn't have thought to try that myself, I don't think. You know, mm-hmm. it, it would it would feel like I would be imposing something. You know, it feels like it feels like that can only happen if I'm invited. You know, it's not, it, it wouldn't, it, the ethos of it wouldn't be right if I'm approaching somebody and yeah. saying, you know, can I do this yeah. for you? You know, that's, it doesn't work that way. It kind of, it has to be, come from a desire from another group or another person to, to look at this and in, in which I then become, you know, um, take a role in that somehow. It's a bit like you know, in a in a in a smaller role. Sometimes I um, act as a dramaturg um, in perform in contemporary dance in theatre, where I might come and give an outside eye in their um, process. You know, mm. they might have done a couple of few weeks in the studio, and I'll come in and and have a look and and help them interrogate that. Try to help them see what they're making you know, it's because they're in, in it and it's intense yeah. and give them an outside eye, if you like. And so, but, but again, that can only really come from an invitation in order for work to happen, I think. That is interesting that there is, a, there is an element of invitation um, of that kind of external voice approaching you in order to transform your work into something else. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that does happen sometimes. I think the people who approach me uh, tend to be interested in the transformative element of my work or, or the, um, the ability of it to present something that we recognize and then pre- turn that on its head. You know, so people who approach me tend to have a desire to, um, to do that for themselves. But do you think those are also the people that see your work beyond its identity? I was just reading your, I think, Guardian, an article from The Guardian from 2019, where I don't know whether you said it for for The Guardian or they picked up a quote from somewhere else, but you said the biggest challenge I've found is being recognised as a British artist outside my ethnicity. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's it's funny since I said that, some things have started to change. Um, right. but, but you know, but that comes with profile and the award and things like I'm sure. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's been a long uh, fight, ongoing. I would say, really, you know, people, as you know, pe- people tend to generalize, um, and so you know, I end up in shows, or I have ended up in shows that are about India that are, that are with Indian contemporary visual artists and I'm the only Brit you know or um and and without any without a sense of nuance in there without any sense of necessary necessary consideration of that in the curation or um and so it's it's you know I get and, and also um, because I'm not Anish Kapoor and I'm not making abstract works you know, I'm, I'm making works that specifically use the sig- signs and signifiers that have cultural specificity to them. You know, and so it, I, it's, e- it's, it's, you find it too easy to sort of lump me in, you know, cultural diversity brown guy thing, like it's like it's a section, like it couldn't exist also in a show uh, it, that's, you know, with with your Damien Hursts and your, you know, and 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 whoever really is Brit- British artists. And so that's been a, a definite, you know, challenge. I, I. I'm just wondering, what is the challenging aspect of that? Is it the misunderstanding of your work? Or is it a kind of false paradigm within the valuation of work in general, 
in relationship to the identity of a of an artist. To to me, I I, I feel it as um, a a denial of my Britishness, um, a, a denial of what the reality of being a Brit or being diasporic identity is, you know, it's, it's a minimizing of that. It's a, yeah, I would say it's a denial, you know, it feels like that. So it feels like you're fighting against erasure. Um, you know, so that's, that's, that's the best I can describe it. If you, if you, if you like, you know, it's, it's amazing that it's done in the name of inclusivity. Yes, it's not inclusive. That's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's the opposite. It's ex ex exoticizing. Yeah. Um, what kind of fet fetishizing and. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, so I, I think, you know, in, in relation to you asking just before this about, you know, people are not necessarily inviting me because I'm a Brit Asian, if you like. It's not other Brit Asians asking me to do the Brit Asian treatment on them, you know. Uh, I, I'm incredibly proud that I that the people that approach me have approached me with things that I have no personal experience of. of of uh, you know disability or you know gender fluidity or um, all these things that, and, I, and I feel like that's a real win because I feel like it means that somebody has seen in my work beyond the specificity of, of of me and where I come from, if you like. And if we look at very kind of specific, maybe points of reference in your work, one of them is say Hollywood. How is Hollywood a tool to channel this discourse? So I guess, you know, Hollywood is one of these... Um, so, for example, the, these things that I might be looking to explore and say, um, it would be pointless for me to create a new language in order to express them. You know, that is an uphill struggle that you don't need. You know, so why not use a language that's already there? And not just a language, but maybe one of the biggest widest spread languages that are highly influential. And so Hollywood is that for me, you know, the, the, the power of Hollywood in order to influence, you know, my nieces and nephews, right? They're, they're, they're young, they're, they like to dress up all the time, right? But when they want to be a superhero, they can be Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, um, at a push, Wonder Woman, you know, <laughs> no, none of these people look like them, you know. So inherently in that, this desire to be heroic, to be um, impressive, to be whatever, is also a desire to change gender for my niece, is also a desire to change ethnicity for, my, for, for all of them. And, you know, if you, if you imagine the power of, say, you know, say the Batman movies, they make a huge profit before they sell a single cinema ticket, you know, in, in merchandise, in, in, in action figures, in, in, in costumes. And so the power of this, um, of that level, of that end of Hollywood, if you like, to, to influence who we want to be, who we, ex who we, who we feel is an acceptable person in society um, is huge. And so that's, that's that's where I want to have influence. You know, that's where I need. That's that's why I'm interested in in that as a as a language, as an influencer, as a, um, and you know, again, that doesn't just come with strategy. That comes with also my love of you know that sort of big end of cinema yeah. and amongst everything else. You know, um, so I think that's that's what Hollywood serves to me. So you know, at the minute, as well as well as kind of a particular aesthetic that I'm, I'm liking to use in my films. I'm also making action figures, you know, mm. from the characters from my films. I'm also making kind of clothing uh, from 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 these films to so almost be in a gift shop. You know, it's like I like the idea that these ideas of who these characters are in my films could occupy space in our day to day lives. 
you know, if they could end up in homes and children play with them, if little white boy Dave is desiring to be a black woman Vicky because she's badass and she does Kung Fu and she's got an incredible costume, you know, or if it's on a, if there's certain ideas that are embedded into a t-shirt and people putting them on their own bodies and moving around the world with them, then, you know, this idea of occupying space in people's lives, on people's bodies, in people's desire, you know, that's kind of, um, the, yeah, that, I think that's, that's w w the big attraction for me. How do you then explain um, Bollywood in terms of appropriation of a different um, culture by a culture that perhaps in that kind of original sense is close to your ancestral culture? Um, I, th I find it really different because Bollywood is still really niche for a particular audience. It's still made specifically yeah. for an Indian audience. And it just so happens that there's more than a billion people in India, I think. And so, you, yeah, so yeah, without yeah. needing to cater to anybody else, you can have fully yeah. Hindi language movies that can be multi-million billion dollar industry yeah. um, without a need to cater outside. Um, whereas- That's interesting. Whereas Hollywood, yes, they're on about their domestic markets, but obviously it's the thing which gets translated through all different countries. You know, how many things are things translated into, um, and you know, they're just seen all around the world and it's ubiquitous. Um, whereas yeah. Bollywood definitely isn't, you know, uh, you, you know of Bollywood, you might have seen a movie or two, but only if you happen to be interested in something a bit different. You know, no, it's not it's not like everyone w will know it. And and also the idea of Bollywood comes with an idea of India, comes with the idea of Indianness in a very exotic way. Uh, mm. Whereas the idea of Hollywood is speaks to us of importance, speaks to us of what deserves to be captured and spread around the world. Um, in beyond um, country specific, you know, it speaks to us of the power of the West, um, you know, that kind of um, goes everywhere. It's like, yeah, universal language. Yeah. And, and you can afford it lots of different styles. Mm. You know, it can be drama, thriller, horror, independent. It can be, you know, superhero, a lot of things. But Bollywood is a very particular kind of thing. It's different from, say, Indian independent cinema, um, you know. Yeah, this what I, what I feel like is that your trajectory is a trajectory from, let's say, a certain sort of cultural background to the universal uh, language. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether there is also a conversation the other way around from the universal language to the cultural background. So. So when you brought all of your family into that room where you recorded the Spider-Man mm -hmm. jump, what was their understanding of that situation? Or was there any sense of unfamiliarity? I would say um, unfamiliarity was, was only really there in the sense of a film crew being there right you know but my asking them to do this weirdly wasn't so unusual meaning that um you know we've been through a, a big journey my family and i over the last 40 years or longer you know but and so you know we've been through moments in our past history where we haven't had as close a relationship where there has been tension or violence in 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 this thing but then you know, certain family members moved on or passed on. And, and, and now we're a very tight, close family. Uh, and so there's a, there's a real trust and between us and, you know, a pride which goes in all different directions between us. And so when I asked them to do this, they didn't really question it. Um, you know, they, they, they trusted me as someone that they like as their family member and will come and do this thing. 
And then I, I wasn't too worried about explaining the meaning to them because I knew that they would get it more when they see the piece. Um, and the and the really the you know the the best part of that circle, if you like, is when they are then in the gallery, not just watching the work, but when they are watching other people watch the work. You know, this is a, a very different experience. You know, of them of of them getting a lens on our family home or the ordinary, the domestic, the marginalised into this arena that it's being celebrated and hordes of people are piling around and watching it on loop. Um, you know, that is the understanding of the work, if you like. Um, and, and so I guess I felt, I hoped that would be the case in, in making it, but in terms of in them engaging with it at that time, you know, I tried to keep it as practical as possible. Um, you know, not just, you know, not just because I feel like the engagement with it will come later, but also as a director, you know, um, I, it's kind of about reading the room, knowing the room and um, thinking about how to make people relaxed and to, to do the thing we need to do. You know, if I would have been in that moment talking about conceptually what I'm interested in um, and what the work should do and that, that would freak everybody out. You know, they'd be like, oh, well, what should we do? I don't know how to do that, whatever. But just keeping it very practical in, in, in the way that we would be in that room at family gatherings and stuff like that was, was yeah. to engage yeah. with that in a way. And, and in terms of how the product ends up, I, I feel like when you say, is it, could it work the other way? I feel like hopefully it's what I'm doing anyway in, in the sense that whilst I'm using the language of Hollywood, the, the music, the aesthetic, the cinematography, all of those things, the, the content of it is not Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's presenting something very different, like in the Spidey. It's subverting, like uh, in the TED talk, exactly. subverting the language, yeah. Exactly, and you know, with a, and it shouldn't just be cerebral, you know, you should be emotionally taken into that. You know, it's like, you shouldn't necessarily have to think of it, but it could just be funny. You know, it could be that the, the music, the sort of epic music can really draw you in to yeah. the emotion of it without necessarily thinking, oh, this is clever or oh, this is funny or, you know, whatever. Or even this has a kind of philosophical point and view on post-colonial Britain or, this or that. Exactly. You know, it's a bit like, you know, the you, you say you say that sometimes if you go to a talk, you might not necessarily remember the the content of what people say, but you remember you, you remember emotionally how they made you feel. Um, and so, you know, in, in the work, if people have a takeaway, it's not necessarily I need them to get all the conceptual layers to it. It's that emotionally I'm interested in them feeling a recognition um to or a recognition or a connection to what's going on there even if you have no experience personally of an indian household you know if you, if you can come away with an emotional contact content uh, connection to that then um you know that's that's part of the aim has your relationship with your britishness changed over the years yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know if that, I mean, that is to do with my work, of course, but it's also not to do with my work. It's also just to do with politically what happens and, and you grow up yeah. and you get different opinions, I guess. You know, it's kind of when I was a kid, when I was young, I probably just would have wanted to be seen as British, you know, um, and I was ashamed of everything Indian, the language, the smell, the food, the color, you know, everything. You know that's that's what um, heavy racism does um, when you live in a white only um, town. Um, so it took me a long time in my adult life actually to start changing the approach to that and to start taking ownership and pride over all of those things. Uh, and in a way, you know, my practice, one of the things that it is, is is a process of ridding myself of the shame of that. You know, it's kind of like um, yeah, taking ownership and uh, pride again 
in all of those things that I was made to feel shame about as a kid, you know, so the, 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 the journey of that is different. And, and that then relates to what I feel about this idea of being British, you know, on one hand, I'm very interested in celebrating the specificity of, of where I come from. You know, my next film is going to have a lot of Gujarati spoken in it. Um, and, um, and yet I'm also interested in it still being located my stuff as a British artist in order that it shows the expansiveness and the mm. breadth of what we are of who we are in Britain. You know, it's like to, you know, I am an advocate that we are not just seen as a narrow idea of, you know, I, I did this uh, when in 2003, I did this camp America scheme and went to America and, and these young kids, there, 16 years old, you know, they'd be, they'd be like, where are you from? You know, like, and I'd say England and they'd go, what? I'd say, yeah, why? He says, yo, they got black people in England, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and so this, this sense of like, and they would ask me like, if we had high tea, at, um, you know, three o'clock every afternoon or, you know, this, this real sense that it's just like, I don't know, Mary Poppins land or, you know, or only white people or only, or monocultural, if, if you, if you, if you, if you want to say that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of my relationship to Britishness, I think that's, that's part of the things that I'm influenced by or, and, and my own relationship to my, my heritage and, and both fighting against and embracing it being part of Britishness, if you like. But I mean, it's, <clears throat> I'm struck by the word of shame and shame because it's a very strong feeling that we sometimes almost don't want to acknowledge. It's a kind of, again, back to the psychoanalysis. It's a thing that then motivates various other things in life and various other actions and forms of self-oppression, etc., etc. And you're able to very clearly, without any doubt, describe something as shame. How do you process that? I mean, I, I think it's very empowering to put your finger on these things. You know, it's like you feel more of it by not admitting it or by not finding that that's what it is or was. And I think it helped me realize that it wasn't my, it's not my fault. You know, it's like, you know, shame actually is, even though we don't talk about it because it's shame, um, it's, I would, I would argue it's one of the absolute biggest motivators of how we shape our identity. You know, Absolutely. it's, it's, if not the biggest, you know, and, and so, you know, it's very, if, if I'm interested in genuinely looking at my relationship to, to heritage, to identity, to existing in this world, then to not look at shame, I'm not sure what I'm doing then. You know, it's like, if, if you know, the idea is to try to look as in depth and as honestly as possible. Uh, in order to uh, for the work if you like to be meaningful for it to make a difference and so to to have realized about that shame and to call it what it is helps me then take action towards it um, and you know to, one to realize that it wasn't my fault to to and, and that and that takes a that is an ongoing work anyway you know to go back and to have seen all these things in retrospect you know like the idea that I didn't really have any teachers of color, um, but I didn't think twice about that until until much later. You know, I just accepted it, and and I'm angry about that. You know, like that that shouldn't be the case. Like the, the idea that I didn't even question it then, you know, shows how how deep rooted this this shame or that or, or racism that I was even perpetuating. You know. And so it, 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 one is part of an unraveling of you realize in retrospect all of the things that were unfair that you'd denied or you'd just brushed over or, or whatever. And then it also feeds what you want to do with that. Um, so, to, you know, to give a very direct example, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm frustrated and annoyed of not having had influence from teachers of color in my art school, then... I agree to do more art talks than I might usually 
just so that I'm definitely a person of color going in and I speak very openly and directly about this. And I noticed that other artists, students of color gravitate to, to me and want to have these very direct conversations that they're not able to have with their tutors. Um, and so, you know, that's part of my responsibility or part of my response to my having been through that. Um, or in my artwork, you know, you know, as, as you grow up and you get a sense that the canon of art history um, is, you know, very particular and, you know, it didn't give you a lot of spaces to look at in terms of your own work. So, you know, it's in my response to that is to want, is not just my work, but also celebrate other artists' work who are doing something different to that, if you like. So it's kind mm. of, so the shame, if you like, it becomes cathartic to understand that that's what it is but also becomes then a place to become a motivating factor of the action to be taken in response to that. You could call it healing. You could call it um, yeah. um, activism, um, whether it's specific artwork or just how I live my life, you know. Is there then a moment of having to reestablish relationship with the, the whiteness that you were surrounded by? Yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, I think part of it for me, and, and I guess this was also further um, lit up through the uprising of Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, it's definitely brought up a lot more anger um, about those things. And, and so what I've been finding myself doing over the past year is trying to work out what to do with that anger um and you know part of me sort of goes okay this this next work feels really angry and i have to, I have to go with it and then part of me goes oh does that make all of my previous work irrelevant do i discard all of that you know and this is me now and then you know i've had to go through a real journey this past year to realize that that's not the case that actually rather than that it's just creating an additional space for this anger to live with all of those other things and that that's completely normal you know that it's going to be we're humans it's going to be contradictory so that the anger can live in my practice with humor with hollywood with you know something more gentle or, or whatever and, that, that, and that's just part of me I guess and so uh, creating space for that I guess so you know in terms of re-establishing my relationship with that it's, it's both uh, allowing anger in I guess which I would which typically I might have shut out. Is, there, is there also an element of recognizing some of that white identity within yourself yeah absolutely absolutely um but that but in a, in a way you know when you say white identity for, for me what i what i feel from that is you know you, you you realize through the environment that i've grown up in you know mainly sort of a, a white only town that i grew up in you, you also internalize and perpetuate racism um usually usually against yourself you know the fact that you would never question you're the only person of color in the room the fact that you would question that you wouldn't question that every marker of success is white and male and straight um you know that's it's it's, it's a recognition of that so i think it's less a recognition of whiteness and more recognition that you know these things that we know that it, it's not as simple as you know um if you're brown, you can't be racist. Or if you're a, you know, if if you're a woman, you can't possibly not be feminist. Or you know, the, these things are so deeply embedded in our structures that we all perpetuate it in in some ways, and un unless we take action against it. And so, in the, the recognition of my, if you want to call it whiteness, or you know, kind of that that part is is a recognition of the things that I have been perpetuating and that are still wired into me in some sense that I'm that I'm act that I actively have to take action against 
you know it's like you know like it's coming out now it's not good enough to be not racist you have to be anti-racist and and that's it, it's work and you know and, and and it's not just white people that have to do that work but they but they do uh, but it's 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 all of us actually you know i i also have to do that work so there's the kind of two polarity but there is one that then you talk about and it's kind of part of your work and that's the universality so where is that universal human i mean it's it's something that i strive for as an idea in the work but in reality it's it's idealistic so it's it's unrealistic in a, in our current world um you know so you know to give a practical uh, sense you know it's it's not good enough let's say for us to let's say there's an organization all the board are men you know and we go right we need to make it fairer um let's work towards doing half half but actually whether it's gender or whether it's people of color you have to actually take action to not make it not try to make it equal but to go the other way because um actually the road to making something equal is just so triplingly slow it it just doesn't work and so yes in an ideal world we're all human we're all people where we are the same but the reality of our world is there's just too much opposing that that we can't um live in that way i, I don't think it, we, we can't live with that feeling you know i can't go about my day-to-day -day life and just feel we're all the same we're kind of all this thing because my reality isn't that uh, and, and i'm aware that lots of people's realities are not that um and and so they have to be action towards that and yes so deep down i believe that but we're we're kind of you know a long way from that and the last year has been a <clears throat> obviously a paradigm shifting yeah black lives matter but also you know just our notion of let's say home has been completely imposed you know we have to declare where our home is so we can only go for an hour walk and also international travel being suspended and so i think there's been a lot of little existential crises uh, on many fronts on which levels have you had a kind of rethinking i mean yeah i mean it's difficult for all of us isn't it we're still in it it's kind of it's yeah. still feels too soon to sort of take any sort of perspective yeah. Um, but, you know, if I had to respond, you know, I guess probably I'll reflect on what I mentioned earlier about a new place for anger in my, in my life and my work, which feels, which feels heavy, but is actually feels very healthy. Um, and even though I wouldn't have thought it at the time, even though it was traumatic to start with, it feels now mm. it feels healthy. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, you, have, you, have you discovered the anger? Was there a moment of like discovering it or channeling? It was always there, I guess, but more under the surface. And then I think the moment that really, like with, like for a lot of people, the, the re-traumatizing effect of so much performative, performative anti-racism on, on Insta and stuff like that, that really made me angry that really, you know, particularly from organizations, uh, but even individuals, sometimes friends, you know, that that was really triggering, you know, I guess because it you, you see it in bits over the years anyway, but happening all at once by everyone. Um, I think that's probably what unleashed it. Um, and, and to start with, it probably wasn't even anger, it was anger, but also sorrow and despair and anxiety and all, all of those things exacerbated by lockdown you know mm. and so that's definitely that was definitely a, a big moment and then um and then finding the way to start 
exercising that in my work um, has been hugely useful for me. And, and, I, and I also feel really grateful for that, you know, meaning so many people will experience that, but without having an out, outlet, you know, what, what do you do with all that? If you, if you don't have a, what, something to do with that, I, I, I consider myself extremely lucky um, to, to, to have that, to, to be an artist, but also to be an artist in a place where I'm good at that, where I have a practice of that already um in a way um you know i i in lots of ways i feel really fortunate as well you know like it's just me and my wife at home we're not in necessarily caring responsibilities for children or elders you know we've got food on the table shelter we're not in that sort of stressful situation and so many people who are um we have had uh, covid deaths in in our in our family um, which, you know, is, is you sort of do think about in terms of the um, uh, demographics of people who are experiencing it um, mm -hmm. worse than others. Um, and so you, I feel like there's not one way. It's like you, you I don't know how you feel, but I, I feel like there's contradictory feelings and you sort of yeah. go wildly from one, from despair to feel real gratitude to you know all, all of yeah. those things and, and 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 probably because we're so separated um it's it's much harder to process that and and, and yet you know i'm also really grateful that i'm at home with my wife you know I, I, it would be so it must be so intense uh for people who don't share a house with anyone at some point or like live on their own or you know it's kind of yeah so it's kind of all of that somehow and that's kind of maybe that's the perspective i have now but who knows a year from now how it will feel. It's also interesting because obviously these perspectives change and, you know, some people I've spoken to, I'm trying to kind of, you know, I'm asking whether they've had a moment of revisiting certain, I don't know, things like books or films. I personally uh, really had a moment of revisiting existentialism Totally. I don't know if you've had a mo if you had any any of those kind of I think moments of revisiting some ideas or I think probably I started revisiting drawing um nice. and um which I haven't done in many many years I can't remember the last time properly really so you know when when all of my projects got unpaused and big deadlines got put away till 6 months down the line or a year or whatever had this space that I just can't remember ever having before that wasn't directed towards a show or, or a commission or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I had a real first for drawing. Um, and, and so I got my iPad and, and started making some animations. And, um, and so, you know, I thought animations, I have to draw every cell of, of the drawing. That's lots of drawings. You know, so it's yeah. kind of like yeah. it's, it's not the kind of drawing I necessarily wanted to spend a long time drawing something. It was just I needed the physicality of uh, of drawing, of doing this repetitive act, of this sort of thing. Laboriousness of it. So. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so I, that that definitely ignited um, in that period, which has now continued in in mm -hmm. other forms so you know the paintings that i'm making are, are really um have come from that um sort of thing mm -hmm. and i don't th i'm not sure they would have come about quite well they definitely wouldn't have come about quite like that if if that if that period hadn't happened and it sort of mm -hmm. affected something you know so i think that's i think when um i think my natural way isn't necessarily personally to 